Hello, film fans and friends of us who obviously are the only people who watch this video. <laughs> Welcome back to our podcast. Have you no faith in the YouTube algorithm? None at all. Um, <laughs> I have some. <laughs> what was our podcast name again? First Draft Films from Indie to Hollywood. Uh, Welcome to First Draft Films from Indie to Hollywood, featuring special guest Robert Clark. <laughs> Wowza. <laughs> Howdy there, all you fine folks on the interwebs. I'm Robert that, Clark. That guy, yeah. <laughs> if you don't already know Robert, you will recognize his name in our title sequence. He is the amazing mastermind behind our, what's it called? The song that plays at the beginning The intro. The intro. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think there's a name other than Grand and Podcast Intro. <laughs> well, there you go. And Kate's ringtone. I'll have a name for it by the end of the podcast. When we recorded part one of Christian art, that had not been written yet. So wait, is that true? Yeah, no. it, it, we recorded in December. Like that's crazy. This is what? six months later. Wow, <laughs> so much life has happened. I know. So much life. Think about how many babies were born in that time period too. It's a probably whole new world. Well, at least thousands. Can you guys believe that people were born after the year two thousand? No. That's crazy to me. I was just. Anyway, yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, most of my siblings and cousins are, were, but like, no, That's they, don't, crazy. they don't exist. And so were mine. Yeah. Sorry, you're fake people. <laughs> <laughs> now hit, smash that like button and subscribe. <laughs> fake people. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah, I'm off to a great start. <laughs> I think the weirdest part is people born in the year 2000 or 2001 are over 21 years old. That's. What's going to be really trippy is when there's people who are born, like, 2010 and beyond who aren't, like, babies. Yeah. Or, like, 12 or <laughs> whatever. I hope that I mean, they're teenagers already, right? So yeah, our brothers. Yeah. Yeah. I hope my grandchildren don't unearth this clip when they're deciding what to where to send me. <laughs> <laughs> don't worry, we won't show them. Okay. <laughs> or maybe we will. So today we are here to do a part two on our exciting and topic of Christian art, which I think there are, is like an infinity amount of episodes we could do on this without yeah. covering, I mean, obviously the history of Christian art and w that would be the history of Christianity in general. So well, as somebody born right before the year 2000 i don't know a thing about history so we're not going to be able to talk about that today brooke and i know about history <laughs> okay but we i know more history well, than i probably should okay i don't know enough history and i forgot was, a lot who of was it. the 22nd president of the united states not george washington dang she's good she's good harrison i'm gonna what, believe you what, what melody were you using Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, Monroe, Adams, Jackson, Van Buren, Harrison, Tyler Polk, Taylor, Fillmore, Pierce, Buchanan, Lee. a president named Fillmore? Or it wasn't Fillmore, was it? It was something like that. Um, Johnson, Grant, Hayes, Garfield, Arthur, Cleveland, Harrison, Cleveland. Because uh, it was the same guy. He, <laughs> the Cleveland got elected twice, but like not sequentially. Mm. And that's weird. That would never happen now. <laughs> Hashtag 2024. <laughs> oh, dang. Yeah, it could happen. That would be cool. <laughs> Y'all are going to get canceled. <clears throat> Do you think we really care about that? We're here talking about Christian art. <laughs> you're right, you're right. <laughs> um, man, the rabbit trails are coming fast and hard. Mm -hmm. Okay, after talking about presidents that nobody remembers. <laughs> Literally nobody. Except Kate. <laughs> Except me. Also, I love how you knew that there was a song. Well, that's the only way. I was like, there's no way you know that unless you have like a song that you memorized. It's like, yeah. It's like, I need to know. Also, the approximate 15 seconds between you asking the yeah, question yeah. and me giving the it's answer. Like there's, there's a melody. I I'm yeah. counting something on my fingers and in my brain. You know, if, if the whole original music thing doesn't work out, I think that I will have a career in just like finding lists of things and making songs for them so that people remember them. There That's you go. Amazing. The world needs a new twinkle, twinkle, little star. 
<laughs> so what he's saying is he's going to replace Mozart. Yeah, essentially. The Mozart of the he's 21st century? I'm sure <laughs> nobody else has called themselves infinitely that. Infinitely worse. Actually, Nobuo Uematsu is the Mozart of the 21st century. Tell us more about this person, uh, of so, whom I have never heard. So he he composes he composed the soundtracks for the original nine installments of the Final Fantasy series. Oh. And it's crazy because this dude was literally just like a keyboard salesman or something at like a small piano shop, and the the guy who made the original Final Fantasy game like happened to run into him at the shop and was like, "Hey, man." Would you ever want to like compose music for a video game? Supposedly, I think the details might <laughs> wow. be a little bit fuzzy, but essentially, like I'm pretty sure that's actually like how he got his way in. And the dude's like the John Williams, the Mozart, the insert who you thought was the best composer's <laughs> name here. Because crazy. It's like and then you take into the into consideration the fact that like when he was making songs for the NES, he was essentially like paint I, I've heard I've heard people describe it this way. He was essentially like painting the Sistine Chapel <laughs> with crayon, but he was still painting the Sistine Chapel, so it was worth something. <laughs> That's amazing. Wow. Anyway, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that music is fantastic. I love those games. Yeah. I haven't played all of them, but you know. Final Fantasy IX. Okay, fun fact. All you, all, all two of you Hesher Cats fans out there, you're going to get some crazy <laughs> trivia to add to the Wikipedia page. Final Fantasy IX is my absolute favorite game of all time. Someday when I'm famous... That'll be in a tabloid somewhere. <laughs> so yeah. Yay! <laughs> when the like twenty seventh Final Fantasy has come out. Yeah. Nine's the best, according to Hesher Katz singer Robert Clark. That's the truth. <laughs> Sorry guys, I have no, I don't know much about Final Fantasy, any of them. How dare it's, you? It's 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 really stupid weeb stuff. I don't. I'm just kidding. And presidents <laughs> aren't. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, Japanese presidents are. <laughs> and that's a segue. <laughs> How am I going to edit this? <laughs> You're I'm here to sell you on out. a timeshare in Tokyo. <laughs> yeah, you've been to Japan since we recorded part one. Oh, oh that's yeah. true. Yeah. Yeah. I don't have much to say about it. It was really uneventful. I'm just kidding. Japan is... Uh, this is okay. Here's another fun fact for the Hesher Cats Wikipedia. Japan is like my favorite place on earth. I'm a, mm. I'm a dyed in the wool, patriotic son of a gun when it comes to the United States most of the time. But then the second I'm reminded of Japan, I'm like, I don't know. I mean, I, I'd, I'd revoke my citizenship. <laughs> <laughs> but the crazy thing is, I'm, I swear I'm not a weep. So I like never watched anime or anything growing up. I just, I went there for like a junior ambassador exchange program type thing when I was a kid. It was just like life changing. Loved it ever since. So yeah. So you're like a genuine fan of Japan yeah. versus all the kids who don't know yeah, anything all you about fake it except fans, from shows. All you, <laughs> all you fake fans out there with your katakana ramen hoodies. Please. Half the internet just screamed. <laughs> <laughs> until, until you got tricked into going to an onsen as a kid, you don't really know. Okay, you know? Yeah. I guess I will never know <laughs> anything about what you guys are talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's better you don't know. It's, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wowza. So, I'll, I'll get us kicked off here. Okay. <clears throat> I realized, as I was preparing for today, that I think I put the cart before the horse with the last episode, because I made a truth claim about beauty. But I realized... There are a lot of people out there who don't believe that truth even exists, or that truth cannot be known. And so, the new claim for today, truth can be known, and truth is that which corresponds with reality. And so, oh man, I've got like, we've got like three degrees of tangents here, so. <laughs> Pick one. Pick the best one. Well, they all, they all lead into each other. <clears throat> so, for those who don't know, I put out a new EP. This is, man, what a horrible time for a self insert. <laughs> but I put out a new EP called Miss You last it's awesome. uh, May. Oh, thank you. It's fantastic. Yes. But it's only a stepping stone to, I guess, consider this your official announcement. There's a new Hesher Cats album in the works 
no release date yet because I want to make sure that everything is like airtight, perfect. Then set a release date and then promote it because I want as many ears on this as possible. Anyway, there's a song that I, I wrote like three or four years ago for this album that initially was called Sky is Green. But then I realized that there was some like really cringy alt-right person who like wrote an article called Sky is Green. And then I was like, well... Maybe not that. <laughs> maybe not that. But the point is, there's not a single sane person on this planet that could tell you that the sky is green. Why? Because we all know that the sky is blue. That is a fact. That is a truth. The reality is, truth exists and it can be known. Just because I say that I'm John Lennon does not make that true. And if you believe, if you sincerely believe in your heart that my belief in myself being John Lennon is satisfactory for that to be true, then you are actually insane, and I'm very sorry for you. Well, okay, maybe I should be more sympathetic and tenderhearted. <laughs> maybe confused you versus are, <laughs> insane. You are, you, are very you are very confused, and you are a victim of people lying to you, and I'm very sorry about that. But we're, we're, my aim tonight is to fix that. So what you're saying is someone's belief in something that may or may not be true, yeah. usually not true, does yeah. not constitute it being true. Yes, that is correct. So this, and this is the basis by which we should be examining every worldview, every position. We want to jump to the subject of Christian art, and so <laughs> this is not going to be a three-hour-long presuppositional apologetics throwdown. <laughs> but the reality is, I know that this book is the truth. It's a Bible, in case you couldn't tell. Also, it's an extra special Bible where every other page is blank. Beautiful. That's cool. For notes? For notes. What? I got tired of writing. Margins. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's amazing. So, the reason that I know that the Bible is true is because everything contained herein corresponds with reality. There is no aspect of life that is contradictory to the Bible. And all of you in the comments section, I know you're going to have a field day. You're welcome to make your response videos. The reality is that all of creation, and yes, I'm using the term creation, creation came from an uncaused first cause. That is, the only way for something to come from nothing is if there is someone who exists outside of everything that we know in the material world and within the constraints of time who could have caused that to happen. You don't get something out of nothing randomly. You don't, you don't have a Big Bang that happens where magically everything just comes into existence we all know that's nonsense this microphone did not appear in working condition of its own accord or by accident by some cosmic accident somebody hopefully not in a sweatshop in china but somebody yeah, i can't see where this is made. somebody assembled this according to specifications and in such a way I got you guys <laughs> doing a deep Sorry. dive inspection. <laughs> I uh, still have so, no clue where it was made either. So, so somebody assembled this microphone to exact specifications for a specific purpose. And so we know, we know from every single created thing in the world created by human hands, a principle that applies to us as well. We were made according to God's specifications. We were made in his image and we were made for a purpose. That purpose is to glorify God uh, in every thought, word, and deed. For Christians, whether we eat or whether we drink, we are to do all things to the glory of God. And so that is the greatest purpose that any person could have. So the purpose for which something was made. Yeah. C.S. Lewis has a thought in his Intro to Paradise Lost where he says, like, his opening statement in this entire book is when you're examining, and this is my paraphrase, obviously, but, like, when you're examining something, an object, something that has been created, ask why it was made. And he gave the example of a corkscrew and a cathedral. They're two very different things. Mm -hmm. They have a completely different purpose. You can't look at the corkscrew and be like, and think it should be a cathedral and be like, oh, well, this is lame. You can't look at the cathedral and be like, oh, well, this can't work as a corkscrew because they are two entirely different entities. They were made for a different purpose. And art is like that. 
and most of the things we do as humans are like that um our grand general overarching purpose is to glorify god but there's a different method and a different a different puzzle piece essentially for that and it's not gonna look the same Mm -hmm. The corkscrew has a very simple, basic purpose. The cathedral has, like, a very grand, elegant purpose, but they're both useful. Mm. And knowing what something was created for is useful in determining, well, its value for one and the point of its existence for another. So this this ties into one of the... So in Ecclesiastes chapter 3... This is probably a familiar passage, even if you're not a Christian, even if you don't regularly read the Bible. You've probably heard this. This is a truth about all things that go on on earth. Uh, In Ecclesiastes 3, it reads, For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to tear and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. So in all of those things, God has allowed them or caused them or permitted each of those things to go on in earthly affairs and he wouldn't allow anything that didn't suit his purposes. One of the greatest contemporary Christian minds who shall remain nameless unless you prod me because I don't want you to get cancelled, cancelled. Doug Wilson. (laughs) It's fascinating. I was watching a, a video where somebody was interviewing him on his thoughts on Christian metal. And nice. he referred to Ecclesiastes 3 in giving his response, and I, I believe that it's the, the correct attitude to have. He made the case that there is an appropriate place for Christian metal, but given the nature of the sound of the music, if that is all that you're listening to all the time, then that actually should be a red flag that there's something disordered going on within you. Not because there's something inherently wrong about hardcore sounds but there's certain emotions that we associate with that that you're not going to experience if you're listening to like really peaceful folk music and it can be the case where somebody who's listening to really aggressive metal all the time is actually really angry inside and so they're, they're listening to music that most closely parallels the emotional uh, whatever that's going on within all that to say like you were saying there are a lot of different things. Not every, not everything is a cathedral. Not everything is a corkscrew. There is a purpose for it, um, and so. But you can't the, necessarily interchange them. Yeah. Sometimes you can, but yeah. sometimes you can't, because yeah. it's not the way they're designed. On the subject of music genres, I was in a conversation with somebody growing up, and they were like, "Well, Christian rap shouldn't be a thing because all rap is bad," mm. and I was like, "It's kind of whack." Well, as a kid, like, I didn't know how to verbalize, like, my frustration with, <laughs> with that comment. But it was like, an instrument is just an instrument. It's not, like, inherently evil. Like, <laughs> What I will say is inherently evil is if your, your flavor of rap is you download a DAW, you pay a, tw- a 1999 subscription to a sound library where they just have a bunch of pre-recorded things that you click and drag and drop. There's a massive difference between the type of person who's pouring effort into composing, orchestrating, or intelligently sampling things in an actually generative, new, fresh way versus... Laziness. Yeah. (laughs) Laziness, being slothful, that's a sin. I feel like I'm extra spicy today. (laughs) Bring it on. If, if you are a Christian and you are deluding yourself into thinking that buying somebody else's preset and clicking it, dragging it into a timeline is making music, I suggest that you learn an instrument or you learn music theory or you just, just apply yourself. You don't have to stay there forever. I'm, I'm going to quote myself here and I apologize. That's like super vain, but I feel like 
my written down thought here is going to be a lot more precise than anything off the dome. That's okay. The reason the reason why I'm so passionate and spicy about you not using the pre-done templates. I don't know. You're probably not even listening to this, whoever this is. <laughs> but just this is a principle that you could apply to anything. The the more that we learn about God from his word, our our affection for him should grow and we should also have an ever expanding concept of his majesty and his glory and his transcendence over his creation. And so it's 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 not appropriate for the Christian artist to maintain a status quo or to think that it's good enough to just scoop by, use other people's things and, and not apply themselves. And the reason for that is God has made art and he's he's given us this communicable attribute of his creativity for a purpose. Ultimately, it's to glorify him. And the way that we do that is by creating art where we, it's, it's a union of the human mind and the human heart working through the hands um, or working through the voice or th- working through the eye as you compose an image. And it's a labor that every single one of us is capable of excelling at in our own ways. If you're getting started in something, by all means, you know, I, you know, it's funny. I, I'm, I'm exposing myself as a hypocrite here. The, the first song that I think I ever recorded was on any of you, uh, late Gen Z folks. If you remember <clears throat> like the OG iPad with garage band and they had like the little module in there that had the electric guitars and you could like set it to a numbered preset and that'd be like a strumming pattern you could like tap some chords on the screen (laughs) and the guitar would just play it for you yeah so that was like the first the first demo song that i ever made when i was in like eighth grade or something but that's eighth grade like come on like give yourself grace (laughs) so it's funny so that was like the first thing i ever did but the reality is god did not give me the what what limited gifts i have he did not give me those so that I could stay at a garage band level. This principle applies to every area of your life, whether it's creating art or or even loving your spouse or parenting your children or doing your job at the at the horrible corporation with bad work conditions. Um, we are to do all of those things to bring glory to God, to work as unto the Lord. And the only reason why I'm alive right now is because... God is giving me an opportunity to grow in my capacity of knowing him, loving him, worshiping him, and serving other people. You know, it's funny, even going back to that, that eighth grade thing, I, I made a demo in, iPad, in, in GarageBand on the iPad. That was like my first foray into the, the realm of music. And that same year, I actually, oh, well, you, you guys have heard the song Lipstick on the Pig. It's going to be on my next Hesher Cats album. I actually, that, that's a song that I wrote in my sleep when I, <laughs> that same year, but I wasn't good enough at playing guitar to be able to actually play it. Wow. <laughs> and, so, and so, like, I, I, I vividly remember waking up one morning before school, and, like, I sat down. I had, like, this really, man, super vivid. I had an Audio Slave poster on one wall and a poster of a Gibson Les Paul because I always thought that that was my dream, but turns out it wasn't Gibson's garbage. Uh, and then I had... Like this really overstuffed blue recliner chair in the corner of my room. And I sat down and I remember like very slowly playing the notes for this song that I wrote on my guitar. It was a a black Epiphone SG special. I still have it, but I'm planning to smash it at some point. <laughs> anyway, so I had this full song, Lipstick on the Pig, that I wrote back then. But I was incapable of like actually executing it the way that I knew it needed to be. And it wasn't until a couple of years ago that I finally reached that point. So That's awesome. Yeah, mm-hmm. y'all can look forward to listening to that. I promise you, it's like actually a good song. So <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be hype. So one thing I've noticed about you and your music is like you're a Christian mm-hmm. and you make music, but you don't make like K Love Christian radio music. Um yeah. 
and not that my question is like why yeah. but like what what is your process behind that how are you glorifying god in this music that isn't god you're so great yeah well so it is it is a growing journey for me i'll just share a little bit of my testimony in this area even within the past few months because even since the last episode that we taped some of my my thoughts and beliefs about music have actually changed and shifted Mm. so going back to the concept of truth actually i mentioned philippians 4 8 ah yeah this this is actually instructions for the way that we should be conducting our thought life and so the reason why i relate this to media is because media influences your thought life We're instructed, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Does that mean we should whitewash everything? No. So. Pretend that that everything is happy all the time. No. So, So this means that one of the most essential parts of being a Christian who's living in a fallen world is that you cultivate a manner of thinking that aligns with the way that God would have you think. It doesn't mean that you only ever listen to Caleb. Because, to be quite honest, most of that stuff doesn't even fit this category anyway. But there are there are things in the secular world that actually do reflect those things. Oh, man, I'm going to flex what a real fan I am. So there's a, there's a really... There's a Chris Cornell B-side demo called um, Someone to Die For. It was covered by Brian May and Jimmy Necco for the Spider-Man 2 soundtrack, but I knew it before it was cool. Just kidding. I found it randomly on YouTube. Uh, <laughs> and it's a, really, it's a really beautiful love song written by someone who, unfortunately, I assume was a non-believer. But it, the song has a lot. It, it's, it's full of truth about uh, love and what love is really like. And, and the whole premise of the song is, the, the person that he's singing to, the person that he loves, he's willing to die for them. In John fifteen thirteen, Jesus says, greater love is no man than this, that he'd lay down his life for his friend. So the heart of love is is doing sacrificial things for the, the good of others. Um, and so there are plenty of songs out there written by secular people who capture this truth uh, within their music. And, and, and in that way, it does meet the the test of Philippians 4 8 and therefore it is something where it actually is a good thing to involve in your thought life now there are plenty of songs that don't meet the qualifications and therefore you can you can write it off because there there really are consequences to allowing your thought life to be dominated by things that aren't true it's it's a very real risk for Christians to make the habit of allowing things that are untrue or things that don't please God to dominate our thought patterns because the more that we desensitize ourselves to sin and to the offense to God that sin is, the easier it is for us to be sinful, to be unrepentant, uh, and to be and to backslide. And so going back to this idea of truth, whatever is true, think about these things. Now, <clears throat> I had a, a very difficult moment a few months ago. So for those who don't know, I, I work at a I work at a church and every now and then they have me preach. And I was preaching a sermon on first Samuel chapters four through seven. Highly recommend that you read them. I'm not gonna give you my sermon now, but essentially it was a sermon about the holiness of God and understanding our place below him um, as his creation and not presuming that we can tell God what to do or, or direct him to, to do our bidding. And it was a really difficult week because it was just, I spent the entire week essentially look just, just studying the holiness of God, which is a really terrifying thing for a sinful person like me to do. Uh, because the more that I look at the holiness of God, the more I see just how far I fall short of his standards. Thankfully, I have the hope that the blood of Christ has washed me clean, that that Jesus paid the price for all of my sins, past, present, and future, where I can have peace with God knowing that despite the fact that really my actions reveal me to be an enemy of God, 
Jesus has clothed me in his righteousness. Uh, and so I no longer have to fear that God will punish me someday for my sins because Jesus took the burden of all of my sins and paid the price for that just about 2,000 years ago. That being said, I was kind of blindsided by the, the reality that I... I Essentially, I was listening to a lot of bands and I, I was promoting... I was promoting bands that stand in direct opposition to God's truth um, mm-hmm. through buying CDs, buying T-shirts, wearing T-shirts. And I realized as a Christian, and not, not just as a Christian, but also as somebody who has been called to a higher standard of representing Jesus to other people, I can't afford to wear band T-shirts of bands whose life testimony and message directly contradicts the truth of scripture so for example queen love queen most of their songs are pretty good however on a personal note we all we all know the personal lives of those those band members and freddie mercury for great example he he lived by a lie and died because of the consequences of a lie that says that sexuality is determined by how we feel inside and not by how god has designed us and so, un- unfortunately, I-, I used to I used to have a queen shirt, loved wearing it, until I-, I really thought about it and realized this queen shirt is an emblem of beliefs and ideals that contradict what God says is true. Therefore, I cannot, in good faith or with a good conscience, continue to wear this or even even have it, because even in a small way, to have it is to pardon lies and to make lies at home in my own heart and to make room for my own sins to to gain a foothold in my life and so it's it's actually really difficult because i most of my wardrobe used to be band shirts i had like 40 or so that i'd collected Whoa. and it was it was a very tear-filled day i went through one by one with my whole cd collection and threw away anyone that had a single song on it that, with lyrics that we're an affront to God, and truth be told, I went from hundreds of CDs down to like maybe four or five, and I even threw away like Christian CDs. Wow. Threw away all of my band shirts except for my Hesher Cats band shirt because. Well, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's been a it's been a season of of growing in understanding. Uh, and, and, and God shaping the way that I look at music. And so it's actually fascinating that you ask that because my, my EP, Miss You, most, most viewers probably don't know this, but less than a year ago, uh, so it was, it was July, it was the end of July last year, I uh, found out that my brother was dead, found him dead in his apartment. I won't go into the details, but it was just one of those things where it's like, it still doesn't feel real, to be totally honest with you. Like, it's just... It was one of those phone calls that you never really think is even a thing. And then, you know, one of your favorite people is just gone from your life forever and you never got to say goodbye. And so the the Miss You EP in large part is kind of just telling the story and, and dealing with a lot of the emotions that I was feeling at the time. Well, and still am. And so... <clears throat> The EP itself is not explicitly, you know, you're not going to hear any of those songs on Caleb because they're not like repetitive, explicitly like Jesus is my girlfriend, boyfriend type music. But I, dig- I digress. But my aim with the EP was to tell a true story about something that God is doing in my life because I hope that people will listen to it. And they might hear some of the tragedy in their own life reflected in the music. And they'll understand something true about God. And so it's interesting because I actually had written... I had written lyrics for the first song prior to sort of this this big event with kind of changing my mind about music that I listened to. Um, and I'd also written the last instrumental song prior to that. And God through changing the way that I think about that, he also made me reconsider even just the way that my own EP turned out. And so what I, what I mean by that is 
in track one miss you it's a very i mean i would say a very raw look into my life and an attempt to kind of just capture like what's been going on up here what's been going on emotionally with losing one of my favorite people and the original version of the song really was just heartbreaking sad soul crushing lyrics all the way through but i i basically got to a point where i was like you know what this this is not true it's not true that this whole thing is purely a tragedy and it's something that just can't be reconciled because the reality is romans 828 very popular verse it says and we know that for those who love god all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose in romans 5 it says in verse 2 through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in hope of the glory of god not only that but we rejoice in our sufferings knowing that suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The setup for the lyrics of, of my song, it does start out with the story of just where I was at. So the song lyrics are, the hands that kept me steady, the weight upon my back is gone, I'm falling forward, and you're never coming back. My brother was kind of a second father figure to me growing up, and just a very important person in my life. And I, I just, yeah, never got to say goodbye to him. And it's been tragic and heartbreaking for my family, but the truth that I knew I needed to include in the song was the fact that God is working it all for good. And so I wrote, I have just one hope remaining and I won't be put to shame because my God is working this for good, all glory to his name. Because that that is the truth. And so what was just a lot of sadness and angst from this personal tragedy, I realized that it's not wrong for me to mourn. There is a time for mourning, and what better season to mourn than when you lose your brother? But I would be remiss if I did not also share the truth that even in the midst of something like this, God is working it to produce something good. And though I might not see it now, I know someday, whether later in life or whether on in the next life, I'll have a clearer glimpse of the way that God was using it to glorify himself and to conform me to the, to the likeness of his son, Jesus. And so the album, you know, it's not like you, like you said, it's, you're not going to hear any of the songs from Miss You on Christian radio, but it is, it is a Christian album because it's framed by the truth of what God is doing. And so even with the last song, it's a little piano solo and the original version of the song was actually unresolved. Um, because I wanted, I wanted to just communicate the feeling of losing something really important and not having any closure. And so I wrote the song with the intention of leaving it hanging with no resolution at the last bit. But I realized even, even though that is true, I do have the closure, I do have the hope that there is a purpose to it. And so the song musically does resolve in the very end. Because even, even through an instrumental track, I want to be communicating something true about God and what he's doing. Oh, <laughs> the other thing. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. This, so the next album that I'm working on is, is kind of similar, um, but it, it will be more explicitly worshipful, especially on the second half. One of the interesting things about scripture is, well, and, and the, the record of, the historical record of what God has been doing throughout human history is God, God didn't just like send Jesus at a random time and expect people to kind of like get the picture. God has laid a framework from the beginning of time to make a point to us. He's revealed himself as our creator. He's shown us that we are fallen and sinful and that sin has consequences and it alienates us from God. He's shown us that the only way for sin to be forgiven is if it's covered by uh, a payment sin demands the death of an innocent sacrifice so we, we have all these things that are kind of laying a laying the groundwork and illustrating a picture to us so that when jesus comes on the scene the bible says that jesus came uh, at the right time 
there, there was a very specific moment for Jesus to come once God had revealed everything that needed to be revealed so that when Jesus uh, lived his earthly ministry and then died on the cross, we'd be able to look at that and understand we have fallen short of the glory of God by every action that we've made of our own power. And yet God loved us enough that he sent his own son to die on our behalf. I think about that that timeline and that structure even in, in my own music where it's it's totally fine to make a, a Christian album where every song is, you know, like a worship song or something that you would hear on a Sunday morning at church. Um, but but what I what I aim for in my music and especially on the, the next album that I'm working on is to parallel more closely the, the way that God has laid out the story of history. Um, because I do think it's important to give people context. I think it's important that it's telling a true story and not just, yeah, I, I guess my desire is just to, to tell a complete story start to finish rather than to have a bunch of self-contained snippet stories, if that makes sense. So that's yeah. that's why it can seem like it's not like explicitly Christian, because not every song is going to be like, Jesus, I love you, even though <laughs> that's the heart behind it. But there's there's more to the love for Jesus that I have than just writing that in every song. Yeah. Again, I, I don't know. I don't want to throw anybody under the bus well i think Mm. that message of like i love you jesus has just been beat to death in christian music over the last hundreds of years you know and so to have the heart of that in a more modern song that's actually really enjoyable to listen to and sing is magical Mm. i mean to put it simply (laughs) yeah one of the things that i've read since last recording for my birthday our our dear friend paula gave me a book called imagine by this guy steve turner and it is all about christian art Hmm. so i really enjoyed that one and he had some unique perspectives that i hadn't heard and he talks about like i guess a framework through which we can look through five different levels or he called them circles like the outermost to the innermost circle of art that we can create as christians and so the outer circle is it does not suggest an obvious worldview it's something fun you're playing with if, if it's a song you're playing with melodies you're playing with words you're just having fun and being creative and exploring that for the enjoyment of it Be, because i mean god created the world to have fun and to be enjoyed and, and so there's that aspect of it even though you're not talking about god or anything you're just having fun with it beauty for beauty's sake if you will the next level in is in your art you're talking about concepts that uh, dignify human life and introduce a sense of awe so you're getting a little deeper because i think what the devil wants us to believe is that our lives are worthless. Human life is not is not anything. It's not any more important than the ant that's walking on the ground. Mm-hmm. But if you have that understanding, I mean, we're made in the image of God. And even if you're just coming at with that understanding, so that's this next level in. The third ring, or the third circle, is something that is a clear biblical teaching, but that's not necessarily exclusive to Christianity. I mean, around the world, many religions and many worldviews talk about the importance of peace and love. Those are kind of in a lot of ways, universal things that even if people who aren't Christians still like believe and value. So, but those are still, I mean, from the Bible, even if people don't know that. And so you're getting closer and closer. And then the second, the, the second level is a Bible specific idea, something that's exclusively from the Bible. And then the, the, like the core of everything is the gospel message. Mm. And so all of those have their value they're not all a corkscrew, they're not all a cathedral, and they all have their their point, I guess. So not everything is going to be talking about how great Jesus is, but it's talking about life experiences and, and all that, like you were talking about with Miss You, mm-hmm. but it all has its its purpose and it all has its... I agree, and, but even then, <clears throat> like just to add on to that, yeah, every step along the way should still be glorifying God. And so there's, you know, with, with simple fun, there's ways where fun can be glorifying to God, where it is fun for fun's sake. However, you can also get it wrong by making the fun turn into something that is an affront to 
God's standards or the truth. Of, you know, yeah. like and just, that is literally my second point okay, is sorry. that, like you talked about with the verse, everything you do and um, mm-hmm. give glory to God. And there's Hopkins. We talk about it at church a lot. There was an essay done by this guy, Gerard Manley Hopkins, and he did, he proffered the claim that whatever you do, as long as there is no sin in it, if you intend that it glorifies God, it by default does. So, avoiding the traps of like, oh, I'm going to do something that unintentionally is Mm -hmm. going on the wrong path, even if it's not, Jesus, I love you, even if you're talking about like how beautiful the trees are, that's still glorifying God. If you mean that it should, I mean, you're yeah. also worshiping like, or not well, worshiping, but like you're like talking about the beauty of creation, which ties into that. But yeah, yeah. for me and for, um, for Brooke and I, as filmmakers, when we create our art, it's not, we haven't done much that is like explicitly Christian yet. I think if mm-hmm. anything, not really. Yeah, so when it comes to other than like this podcast, other than the podcast, but so, we haven't made a film that's mm-hmm. like explicitly talking about Christian ideas. Would this be an okay time to share my screenplay that I wrote for a Habakkuk biopic? Sure. I'm just kidding. I don't have one, but you guys should make one. <laughs> that would be really sick. I don't remember enough about Habakkuk. <gasps> Okay, that's like my favorite book in the Bible, actually. You scared me. Bro, I'm, I'm sit down. Okay, so. Uh, Habakkuk, <clears throat> basically, he was a prophet where God told him, like, hey, I'm going to destroy your nation here soon, and your nation's going to be led out to captivity for 70 years. And not only that, they're going to be led out to captivity by, like, literally the most wicked people around. And Habakkuk was, it was, he wrestled with God. Habakkuk, actually, his name means wrestler. Mm. So, fitting. Uh, yeah. He wrestled with it because he knows God to be good, and yet not only is God punishing his people but he's punishing them at the hands of a people group that was actually worse than they were and god god answered him gave him prophecy about what was to come for those who punished his people but the book of habakkuk closes with one of the most beautiful passages in all of scripture it's essentially a song in which habakkuk comes to terms with and and is at peace with and, and knows that God is good regardless of the circumstances. He, he trusts in God's character and who God says he is. And to the degree where he writes, uh, though the fig tree should not blossom, what Habakkuk is getting at is like, even, even if the worst things befall me and my people, I'm going to trust in the Lord because I know that he is good. Anyway, it would make for a great movie. It's well, also as we tell everybody who comes to us with movie ideas, you should write it and then we'll consider okay. it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, the the final track on the next Tesher Cats album is actually my own version of the the song of Habakkuk. So I am nice. so excited. It's gonna be That's a awesome. banger. But yeah. I was thinking about because uh, even though we haven't made a movie or a show or anything that's directly about Christianity, we 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 brush on topics and we kind of give our opinion on some things that are controversial in some ways, like the Palm Springs of Washington, the short film was essentially about self-defense and then dealing with trauma of having to defend yourself. And what do you do with that? Which is controversial, but that was our opinion on it. But um, I was just thinking recently of when we were in 29 Trouble, and I don't know how much we can talk about this without spoilers, but there's a certain episode where it's, it's episode nine. Well, we were writing this and we're like, okay, what do we do? Like we, w- <laughs> so <laughs> we ended up like going kind of like on a theological deep dive of like, what is actually ethical here? Mm-hmm. And what do we want to portray? Because we want to do this right. Mm-hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, I, I'm having trouble if we remembering it non spoilery. <laughs> well, the, the basic question we were struggling with is like, we have this group of vigilantes, right? They kill people. Not ethical. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they only kill bad people. But, like, at what point does only killing bad people, like, how many bad people can you kill before you become bad? And then there was also the aspect of if you have a 100 people following some evil leader, are every single one of those people evil? Or are they 
being lied to and being blindly led and they don't really know what they're doing are they guilty by default do they deserve to die for that questions like that and so we <laughs> we we've been exploring a lot of answers and gaining a lot of truths trying to say this without being spoilery yes <laughs> I won't tell you the conclusion we came to. You'll yeah. just have to watch the episode for that. And all of a sudden, this became a podcast about Romans 13. <laughs> this is kidding. the Romans podcast. I the Romans and Habakkuk podcast. <laughs> God has actually instituted spheres of authority uh, in in human society where the the duty to bear the sword against evildoers actually belongs to the government and not to vigilantes. Mm -hmm. um, and actually in the law of, of God revealed in Exodus, there are rules about killing and murder where it is permissible to take someone's life if it's in self-defense. And if, if there was either very clearly an intent on their behalf to take your life or uh, the specific case given, I think in Exodus 22, it's either 20 or 22, is if somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the night, like you don't really know what the motivation is. You know, maybe they're there to steal your toothpaste or <laughs> maybe they're there to decapitate your children. Are you really going to sit there and try to figure it out? You have every right to take their life in self-defense and you will not be held accountable by God. However, if somebody breaks into your house in the middle of the day and it's obvious that they're taking your stuff, God makes it clear that you cannot take their life. And so... That's one of those situations where sometimes burglars come in and they're armed. So exercise your best judgment. Point is, don't be a vigilante going about with the intention of just killing people because God does not uh, abide that. That is sinful. But anyway, that's murder. But what if there is no government or an evil government and innocent are being slaughtered? I was just going to say, the... Um, the kind of quandary we, that we've been running into is there is no government on this planet. Mm. There is no one to bring about justice for these bad people murdering and kidnapping and selling people. So these good people have kind of brought it into their own hands to try and establish their own justice system. So yes, they're vigilantes, but in I'll the wake of no nothing else. I'll be real with you. I've done a great amount of study on biblical principles applied to the real world. <laughs> I have not done a modicum of study with how scripture applies to sci-fi <laughs> realities. So yeah, most people have not. <laughs> so, anyways, we we did come to a conclusion based on um, all of the theological advice does, we've received. Does God exist in your universe? Yes. Is it the God of the Bible? It is supposed to closely resemble. Yes. Okay. Do people have both? natural revelation and written revelation of who he is? There's one main character who does. The mm -hmm. others are not religious, at mm -hmm. least at the beginning. Yeah. It's like a bunch of agnostics and a sort of semi-wandered away Christian is like yeah. <laughs> the, at the, beginning. The, the, the starting point. But there's no, there's no like law written for people to... There is an ancient religion that has been kind of lost to time. More or less. It's not like the law of the universe that okay. people abide by, but like it is, but no one abides by it anymore, really. Especially not on this planet. Hmm. Here's, we're taking this back full circle. Ooh. So one of the biggest things with truth is that truth is immutable. If something is true right now, then it will always, I guess there are categories of truth. If, if it's true that a person is a person, made in the image of God yesterday. That's also going to be true tomorrow because that's one of the fundamental rules of creation. That's one of the mm -hmm. fundamental things that God has revealed to be true. And so it's interesting that you talk about in your show like something being true or lost and and not necessarily being true to people in a different time. I don't remember exactly the way you phrased it. Uh, because the way that we think about truth culturally today is that truth is just whatever is agreed upon right now. I don't think that's what she was saying, though. Okay. She was saying that people well, don't know the truth anymore. Yeah. Right? Okay, well, I was so, just... So, slight tangent, but... I was yeah. just segueing. I was, I was trying to... Yeah. I mean, there's still this. the universal truth of, like, don't kill people. That's bad. Don't, <laughs> don't, don't, don't murder don't people. Don't murder people. 
Thank you. You can sometimes you can kill. Right. And it's okay, but don't do not murder. That's anything. one of the conclusions we came right. to. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. All of our studying on, on this for this episode, the epi- the sci-fi episode, not this episode. Right. Not this podcast. Yeah, uh, We're doing no murder here. <laughs> He's gonna say, I mean. Yeah, you're welcome, Robert. <laughs> yeah, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed having two parts because there will be no part three. <laughs> yeah, this is this is it, guys. Uh, closing. What was your closing question, Brooke? <laughs> if you remember, it's right. a lot less exciting than what we were just talking about. Uh, Death and destruction. <laughs> I was just wondering, Robert, if yes. you have any advice for Christians who are aspiring to get into the media in some way, film or journalism or news mm. type stuff or any kind of art, um, but they're also struggling with, like, how do I make this appealing to the world without conforming to them, Yeah. but also still getting the message across without being pushy? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm actually going to take you to my very favorite verse in the entire Bible. Is it in Psalms? It is, and it's one that I guarantee you guys are not... Expecting. I just read Psalms, so. Okay. Not what we expected. We, do you guys do you guys have any guesses before I read it? Nope. Psalm one nineteen one oh five. No, it's somewhere in the tens or twenties. So Psalm If uh, oh never mind. Psalm twenty <laughs> verse seven reads Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. This is an idea that I did not understand when I was a more immature believer i had the belief that people could be one to christ or they could be convinced to glorify god through appealing to them with earthly means or or by following in the the footsteps of earthly things reality is what what psalm 20 verse 7 is saying some trust in chariots and some horses but we trust in the name of the lord our god saying that 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 verse is specifically talking about battle and so it's talking about going to battle and there there are people who place all their trust in their equipment their horses their chariots their swords their bows whatever it's like man i've got we've got the best military there's no way we lose i've got the best software there's no way my music sucks i've got the best connections no way that this thing falls through oh and this is also from psalms i think 137 i could be wrong Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborer builds in vain. And so, for Christian artists, again, and I said this in the last video, but I will reiterate the point, it's not natural for people to have all the answers. However, God has promised that he bestows wisdom liberally to all who ask and all who seek him with faith. And so my encouragement to you would be this. Get a Bible. Not to be a salesman here, but I'm telling you, okay, I'm not just going to show you a blank page because that's lame. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Get yourself a Bible. Make make a habit of asking questions of Scripture. Hmm. Studying it to find out answers. Because that's a lot more productive than just like, you shall be the exits of the city on the north side, which is to be 4,500 cubits by measure. Three gates. There's a reason why Ezekiel closes with specific measurements. I actually don't know because I haven't studied Ezekiel in depth. So now I have something to do tonight. <laughs> but He's going to study all 48 chapters <laughs> <yeah>. tonight. <laughs> but every single word in here is recorded and preserved for us for a reason. And the reason is to reveal who God is to us, to show us the love of God for his people. And so for Christian artists, my encouragement to you, start praying. Start asking God that he would give you wisdom in how to pursue and how to cultivate whatever gifts he's given you. As you pray for wisdom about that, start to ask questions of his word and ask the Holy Spirit to give you insight and understanding of God's word. The other thing is to get get involved in a church. You need to be rubbing shoulders with other Christians that love God and love you and who can give you godly feedback, godly direction, and just the fellowship that comes with rubbing shoulders with other believers. Um, You need to be sitting under sound teaching so you want to find a church where they're teaching the truth of god's word and they're not just like throwing in their random opinions and thoughts and stuff because opinions are worthless what else practice your craft 
God, God did not give us gifts so that we could squander them. The parable of the talents in the book of Matthew, Jesus tells us a parable of these servants who are given shares of their master's wealth. And the master's expectation is that they bring a return on it so that when he comes back from his journey, they have something to show for the fact that he entrusted them with something that's special to him. Mm. And so for each of us, we've all been gifted in different ways and we're all uniquely, fearfully and wonderfully made as the psalmist tells us. God has knit us from our mother's wombs for a very specific purpose and he's bestowed upon us blessings of gifts and he expects us to foster and cultivate those gifts for his glory and for the good of of those around us so get busy if i mean hopefully you know what those gifts are if you don't just try things have fun live a little get off the couch and find things that you love doing and then start getting good at that and figure out how you can invite other people in and show them the truth of who God is and what he's done for you through that. I don't think anything else needs to be I think that's said. great advice. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Robert, for joining yes. us again. Um, yeah. This has been a very fruitful conversation. Yes. Uh, yeah. I'm glad we got to have this chat again. New Hesher gets album next week. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Not next, next week. week. <laughs> Not next week. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Soon, though. Soon. And stay tuned for some exciting other things can mm. i say what they are go for it yeah a music video two music videos oh my goodness uh coming out this year one of them will hopefully be hitting the youtubes soon soon within weeks within weeks we are not giving you a number of weeks <laughs> just <And> plural <laughs> who even knows when this podcast is getting uploaded friday is, this friday oh friday oh wow two days from now congratulations two we've days ca- to mentally we've, prepare. we've caught up to you dang okay <laughs> Ooh, time to front load a bunch more episodes. Good luck, Kate. <laughs> <laughs> I got this. Anyways, uh, it's It'll getting late. It'll probably take me two so hours. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all so much for watching. Thank you, Robert, for being here. Yes. My pleasure. Um, do the like and subscribe thing or whatever it is you do on this platform. and Smash that like button. <laughs> we the best. And then also smash the like button and subscribe to Hesher Cats. Yes, definitely. I will love you forever. Yes. Have a great night. We'll see you next time.